all, uh, I would like to convey you the greetings of Ambassador Kılıç. Uh, he wanted to join us tonight, but uh, a last minute change, uh, because of a last minute change, he couldn't make it. But he, he uh, I, I would like to convey his best wishes uh, for this program. Uh, tonight we are gathered here for a special lecture by uh, Professor Edward Erickson on his newly uh, launched book, Gallipoli, Command Under Fire. Indeed, Çanakkale Wars occupy uh, a distinct place in Turkish history, a, a very unique uh, place, and in uh, 2015, we are commemorating this uh, important uh, turning point of uh, our history. Uh, almost uh, half a million people died uh, in this tragic uh, war, and uh, as uh, some of you might know, uh, the crux of the matter regarding this war was that uh, with this war, one of the main uh, lifelines of the Charis Russia was blocked and uh, it changed the uh, destiny of uh, Russia and uh, it was a landmark in the First World, uh, World War history. Uh, the Battle of Gallipoli was also different from many other wars in, in terms of uh, respecting military codes of conduct and ethics. Uh, that's why the uh, battle is also known as the gentleman's uh, battle. Uh, this weekend I was able to uh, watch this Walter Divine Rant. It was an impressive uh, movie. Uh, I strongly recommend you to, 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 to watch uh, this movie. So uh, we would like to thank uh, Assembly of Turkish American Associations the American Friends of Turkey and uh, Institute of Turkish Studies for organizing this event. Professor Erikson is, is very well known to all of us uh, with his great books and publications that focuses on Ottoman uh, army uh, during the First World War uh, era. Uh, with his enthusiasm and ex deep experience on this topic, it will be a great pleasure for uh, all of us to listen to him. Without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone to uh, Professor uh, Erickson and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for the kind remarks. Um, I expect to be arrested when I touch down in Istanbul this next time, and uh, you can forward my mail to me at Salivary Prison. Uh, <laughs> I, I, the, uh, I haven't read the article yet, so, so we'll see. Uh, I, I'm frequently misquoted, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Um, I hope I don't put you to sleep. If you bought the damn book, um, please don't operate heavy equipment or drive a car while you're trying to read it. Um, it is a military history, and, and that puts many, many, many people to sleep. Um, OK. What's the book about? There are a couple levels of war. At the bottom level, the tactical level, this is what soldiers do. This is, this is blood and guts and, and, and weapons and, and human, the human condition and trenches. Uh, this is where battles were fought. At the upper level, the strategic level of war, this is national decision making. Um, in our country, the National Security Council, the president, this is what they do, and this, this, this is, 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 a, is a much higher level. So there, there's a missing element here, and that's called the operational level of war. This is what I teach on at the Command and Staff College. This is all about campaigns and generals, and what this does, this is the linkage. Campaigns are a series of battles and engagements designed to achieve a strategic purpose. So it's a linkage of a sort. Uh, and it's an intermediate level of war. This is what the, what the book focuses on. It focuses on a campaign, um, which is a series of battles and engagements. There are really three campaigns that I'm going to talk about in this particular case. Uh, I'll start with the myths in history, uh, some of the, the, the mistakes we make when we talk about Gallipoli, um, then talk about the three campaigns themselves. 
it's, it's, it's a blur for most of you. Most of you are not, are not historians or, or serious uh, military buffs, uh, and it's all a blur. It's trenches, and, and, and Mel Gibson's in there somewhere, uh, and now you got the water diviner, and, and it's bad juju for everybody. Uh, but, but, but most of you don't, don't understand really how, how the thing progresses over a nine-month period. So I'll talk about those, those campaigns, and then I'll just briefly, without trying to bore you too much, talk about the thesis of the book and, and, and how it's different and, and what it adds to the historiography, the story of history of the Gallipoli campaign of 1915. Okay, so some of these mythology things that, that, that we deal with um, are the result of an Anglo-centric Western literature uh, that focuses on the British experience primarily. It's an apology for why the British lost to the, 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 the terrible Turks, to the sick man of Europe. Uh, and some of the mistakes that, 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 that they just made too many mistakes. The literature is full of this, that mistake after mistake after mistake. So, so the British lose the campaign, lose this series of campaigns because they make too many mistakes, not because the Turks were particularly good soldiers. Uh, it, it's a way of explaining to it. And, and even the Turks are, they're good soldiers, but they're not good enough and they must have had German commanders. There are a few German commanders sprinkled here and there, but not as many as, as the British history tends to focus on. Um, the idea that the Turks are clumsy, that, 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 that they're, they're primitive peasants, um, unindustrialized, not capable of waging modern warfare, not true at all. Frequently they talk about um, how outnumbered the Allies were. That's not true. In fact, the reverse is true in almost all cases. At the point of contact, uh, the Turks are almost always outnumbered man for man. The Turkish myth, Mustafa Kemal, the man of destiny. Churchill is the one that coins that phrase. Uh, three times, according to Churchill, Mustafa Kemal turns his campaign around and wins it for the Turks. The Turkish historical narrative focuses on this. Uh, he's an important guy. He's one of a number of, of, of important guys. Uh, his leadership style is dynamic and dramatic, but, but it's not much different than many other Ottoman officers who fight in the peninsula as well. You take Mustafa Kemal out of the Gallipoli narrative, would the Turks have won? I think so. There were enough other good guys besides him. So those are some of the, myth, the myths about this campaign. It starts with these people, um, contentious lot. They, they bicker, they, they're powerful personalities. Winston Churchill is one of the ones who, who, who constantly tries to, to get uh, the British back in the fight by way of the Royal Navy. Uh, Kitchener, uh, Asquith is, is the Prime Minister, uh, but, but it's, it's war by committee. The Ottomans have war by one man. The, the Ottoman counterpart to this is, is, is Enver Pasha, who can make decisions unilaterally and quickly. Um, a camel is, is a horse built by a committee. That's kind of what these guys do. This is their problem. They, they've got excess resources. They've got ships that they don't need from the North Sea. They've got a few land forces here or there that won't make a whit of difference if they send them to France. So what to do with these? Where, how, how to apply this massive force intelligently to the point where it can, it can make a difference and tilt the battle back toward the Allies? So, so where to apply? They're, they're, they call these schemes. Some of them are in the North Sea. Some are in the Baltic Sea. Some of them are in, are in the Adriatic. And they all involve putting a British expeditionary force on the ground somewhere uh, for a limited amount of time to, to trim the sails of the central powers. It's based on a set of assumptions. All military plans are based on a set of assumptions. In 2003, the Bush administration and the Joint Chiefs of Staff assumed that when Saddam Hussein fell, that there would be a follow-on government set up by Iraqi expats and the country would stabilize and we could go home. Well, when assumptions fail, then you're stuck. Same thing happens to the Brits, it happens to us in 2003. They're stuck here because the assumptions go bad. Um, there's a stalemate on the West Front. One of the assumptions is that we can use the excess forces and sea power, we can leverage that somehow. And oh, by the way, the Anglo-French are, are better than the Turks. Hamilton and his the allied commander in his diary says, one Brit, is worth 10 Turks. Now that's a hell of an equation when you think about it. One Brit's worth 10 Turks. It's a social Darwinism construct, a period of the Victorian Edwardian age. But they believe it. 
And they, they go into this thinking, thinking that, that a handful of us can overcome lots and lots and lots of them. They think the Ottoman Empire is fragile politically. They think if some ships show up off Constantinople that the regime, the Young Turk government, will crumble. They think that this can be done with, on the cheap. Second-rate forces. The best British forces are in France. The best naval forces are in the North Sea. But we got some strap hangers. We got some stragglers. We got some also rans that we can send down here, and they're good enough to beat the Turks. They think it'll be quick, <laughs> and they think it'll be low cost, and they think it'll be decisive. So there you go. There's 2003 all over again. Soldiers and diplomats and 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 leaders of every country in the world think this way um, at cost. Uh, and, and all of these go tragically wrong in 1915. You're familiar with the geography, uh, so I won't belabor this. It's the Dardanelles. Um, this is a place of encounter. This is not a place of culture or beauty or, or great cities or poetic, um, beautiful, idyllic scenes. This is a place where people go to fight, and they always have gone there only to fight from the time of the Trojan War. And it goes up through Byzantine times and, and Duckworth's assault in 1807. So over and over and over, people come to this place to do one thing, and that's to fight for control of this land. That's what they want to do. They want to knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war. How to do that? Well, we're going to put a fleet and some soldiers in Constantinople, and because of the assumptions that I showed you, we know the Ottomans will, will crumble and they'll be out of the war. We can then take out the Austro-Hungarians and we can hit the Germans from the back. So it's a great strategic concept. Churchill is kind of the one who, who gets credit for this. Um, but at the strategic level, that top rung, this is what they're trying to accomplish. There are three campaigns. The first one is the naval campaign. 18 March is Victory Day in Turkey. Um, this is the Dardanelles. It's heavily mined. It's heavily fortified with, with coastal artillery. There are howitzers up in the hills that deliver plunging fire. The British have an idea that they can take this by ships alone. I don't need any infantry to take this fortified channel. I can do it with ships alone. There's a process. Admiral Carden, the initial admiral, uh, is tasked to come up with a plan. He says we can do it in four phases. One, two, three, four. It'll take two or three weeks. Churchill buys into it, and away they go. Um, <clears throat> the attacks start in 19 February. By 18 March, they, they, they've still not resolved the, the dilemma of breaking through. Carden, the, uh, the admiral who had the four-step process, has, has, has uh, had a mental breakdown. He's been replaced by the guy on the left, John DeRobeck. Churchill says to him, can you do it? He says, yep, sure can, and away they go. And on this day, um, the British and the French lose three battleships. Uh, several are damaged, uh, the Inflexible, uh, one, of the, one of the battle cruisers that's important to Jackie Fisher, is damaged. Um, but this thing goes sour quickly, and it goes sour because that little minesweeper, the new threat, has laid a belt of mines. All the mines go perpendicular to the channel. They've laid a, a tricky one here. As the Allied ships turn, they run into this minefield and lots of them go down. It's a disaster. Um, that's the end of the campaign. Simple. Uh, they, they stand back and they say, how's that working for you, the Dr. Phil thing? And, and, and it ain't. It's not working at all. So we've got to do something different. If we, if we keep doing this day after day, we run out of ships. The second campaign. So the first campaign designed to reach Constantinople, ships alone. The second campaign is the amphibious campaign. This is the one where, where all the land forces come in. This one starts on April 25th, Anzac Day. The opponents, there's our boy Lehman von Sanders. He's a German general staff officer. He's got a Turkish army underneath him. Uh, the boys at, at the point of contact are the Ottoman Fifth Corps, I'm sorry, the Ottoman Third Corps, led by Esat Pasha and our friend Mustafa Kemal, the 19th Division Commander. So on the far left-hand side, those, those are the two army divisions, about 30,000 men altogether, who are gonna defend the Gallipoli Peninsula uh, from the Allies. 
Long story short, it looks like that. There are guys on the beaches with rifles. There are reserves up in the hills. Um, they're spread out. They, they've been waiting for nine months for something to happen. They're well trained uh, and, and they're ready for action. The um, Third Corps that defends the peninsula, the 19th Division, the 9th Division defends the beaches, the 7th Division is up north at Sarhos Bay near Bel Air. Uh, this is, this is the, the best corps in the Ottoman Army. So one of the things that I like to, to stress about this is, is you got not quite the worst of the Allied forces available uh, on the other side, but, but at the tip of the spear, uh, on the Ottoman side, you've got the third corps, the, the best corps in the army, led by their most experienced corps commander. So this is the first team that, that's, that's defending this peninsula. Uh, 